Okay, welcome back. We are here in Seb's kitchen. Hello, Seb. Hello. Hello. This is this is where I cook. This is it. This is the place. This is where the magic happens. Yep. This is where our minds will be blown. Um, so we've got all the ingredients and also all the equipment out that we'll be using. So you can have a quick look, and if you need to get stuff out, then now would be the time to pause the video and do that. And what are we going to be starting with? Are we starting with some prep? So we will start by preheating the oven. Ah, yes, yeah. very good. Very uh, good. While we then kind of cut up the squash. So um, in the recipe, it says preheat the oven to about two hundred degrees Celsius, four hundred Fahrenheit. Um, my oven, however, is a bit broken and it's a giant ball of fire. So I'm <laughs> going to preheat it to about a hundred. You should not do this if you have a functioning oven. Okay, uh, so but, it should be what was that? Two hundred. Yeah. So if I put my oven on 200, it will incinerate the squash. Right, that's um, so, good. so I'm doing it a bit less, but you don't need to do that. And then we're going to take, you know, preferably a sharp knife. In Very fact, good. Let me I know. might even take out my sharp oh, knife. Oh, hello. Just give that a little... Now that is a professional piece of equipment that I've yeah. never seen before. Have you never? Well, yeah, I mean, they're not like one of those... Yeah, we've got one of the old, like... Swords. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> those are on. probably better. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you should always have sharp knives. Our last cook, uh, oh no, one before last, Spencer, he says he has a man that he takes mm. his knives to, to get sharpened. Yeah. That's the next level. Yeah, because um, actually a lot of accidents in the kitchen happen paradoxically with dull knives. Yeah. Because you're trying to cut something and it's dull and it slips. Yeah. So it's actually safer to have a sharp knife, even though people are a bit scared of them. So we're starting with the squash prep, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So the good thing about this is, um, you know, you don't need to, let's see, we'll have a bowl where we can put our onion skins and food scraps in, but you'd actually don't need to peel the squash nice. or the pumpkin. Oh, right in the bowl. Good save. <laughs> Because um, cause it's because it's a hassle, uh, yeah. and and actually the skin is good for you, as yeah. with a lot of fruit and vegetables. Um, once you roast it, it's perfectly edible. It'll soften up, so don't worry about it. And you kind of want these sort of half moons, uh, you so know, you're not too thick. Thick slices and then halving them. Yeah, okay. exactly. So just obviously, if you have a pumpkin or a different shaped squash this is going to be very much down to you to kind of figure out how the best way is to prep it but um let me pick up one of the slices here this kind of size chunk is what we're yeah. going for so kind of like yeah semi-disc sort of things yeah doesn't all need to be completely consistent but um yeah it's good because you don't need to make it you don't need to be Chopping stuff up really yeah, fine. Yeah, I'm going to put this back while you are not chopping. And actually, uh, just to get it out of the way, we can have a, a bowl here. If you start putting it in a bowl later on, we're going to basically chuck in some oil and some garam masala and salt and pepper into nice. that bowl. And obviously, if you're using a pumpkin, you tend to not to have to peel pumpkins as well, right? If they're like Hokkaido or... Yeah, exactly. I've done this with pumpkin as well, where I didn't peel it, and it was fine. You can probably hear Byron in the background. He's getting very excited about who knows what. <laughs> it's probably someone sneezed in Prenzlauer Berg, <laughs> and that's just setting him off now. Uh, and yeah, so generally with a squash, the top bit of it, you just kind of go along that way. And then once you get to this bit, you kind of want to cut down the middle mm -hmm. so that you can then take out the seeds. Yeah. And I'm just going to grab a spoon to do that. This is where your handy bowl comes in. Yeah. Yeah, I just find it's always easier and like just, just to be a bit more organized in the kitchen. Yeah. To just have a little thing where you put in all your food scraps. And then, I tend to just fling it everywhere and yeah. open the right beds. I don't, I'm not always uh, super organized, but I will pretend to be for the camera. <laughs> so your general cooking style, I mean, is this a typical example of what you might make for yourself on a, a standard weeknight? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, particularly during lockdown, I was uh, the first lockdown. 
I was getting a lot into cooking, as I guess a lot of people were,、mm-hmm. and I made some sometimes unnecessarily elaborate meals. Yeah. But it was just kind of fun to to do that, just to have something to do.、Um, but yeah, I do make a fair few. I've added a few recipes from that book into my repertoire. It's not always. I mean, I do like to eat a fair bit of Asian stuff, but I also eat a mix of stuff. I'm originally from Spain, even though the accent doesn't give it away.、Mm-hmm. Uh, but I will, like for example,、uh, Spanish omelet. You know that's kind of a bit of a staple. I'll probably make that once、yeah. a week and then just sort of munch on it throughout the week. Your tortilla is extremely good. We might have to revisit you、yeah. at another time for you to make that for us.、Uh, hummus, you know that kind of stuff. I tend to have quite often. Can one make a meal out of hummus?、Uh, no, but you can do other things with it.、Mm-hmm. You can throw in some grilled vegetables, put it in a sandwich.、Um, whoops. Maybe not, yeah, that's not the, the most practical thing to wear. <laughs> yeah, because they do get a bit slimy.、Uh, squash at this point. Yeah. Yeah, because my go-to. I mean, I cook a lot of different things, but I do tend to get a bit stuck on pasta.、Mm. Um. So I'm always interested to know what other people's like. Go to is if you've just had a long day or just feeling lazy. For you, would that be would that still be something? I wouldn't necessarily make something as elaborate as this. Yeah. I mean, it's not that elaborate, but it does take you know about an hour or so.、Uh, yeah. I mean, sometimes if you just want something quick, like a tuna and tomato pasta, I might make、mm-hmm. that. Something like that. All right, so we've got our squash all chopped and prepped and in the bowl.、Mm-hmm. And what happens next? So now we're going to pour over some oil, maybe about a tablespoon or so. I'm not really measuring it. You just basically want enough oil to reasonably cover the. Squ- whoops, a little bit went over <laughs> the side,、that. but that's fine. And, and you know,、side. you want enough oil so that when you get your hands in there, get them a bit dirty, mix it all in. Yeah. Um, the, there's going to be enough oil to just about cover all of the pieces of squash. I think that looked like maybe、yeah. about two tablespoons. What you put in there? Yeah, and then maybe a teaspoon, a bit more of salt,、mm-hmm. some pepper, and、um, then the garam masala is going to go in and coat it as well. And it's about a tablespoon of garam masala, which is roughly what I have left of the.、Um, Garam masala that I made previously, so、okay. I'm going to use all of that up, and that's that's about a tablespoon. So yeah, you just want to then once you've done that. So that's all in. It's obviously not mixed in at all. But then I'm looking just, forward to seeing you trying to mix this without dropping any of this.、Uh, that's not going to happen. I don't <laughs> think. But we'll see. I don't know if I'll drop it on the floor, but I might drop it on the rack that's just beneath it. Small bowl it. for it. Yeah, I know it's the biggest bowl I have. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so you so really、that's... just want to be getting in right with your hands and mixing it all together. Yeah, exactly. And let's watch you make a mess of this. Yeah. So I think that that's. I mean, it doesn't need to be perfect. That looks about right. The bits at the bottom are definitely going to be a bit left out of the spice, but now、oh, there's some spice spice accumulating at the bottom. To be honest, once you pour it all on the rack and shake it about, yeah, it'll exactly. Do we have a light on this?、Uh, uh, possibly. No.、Nope. <laughs> There we、hey. go. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs>、uh, okay. So I'm going to move that off to the side. Does that mean you've never turned that hood light on?、Before? I have turned that light、oh, on before.、Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just couldn't remember which button it was.、Yeah. That's all. Because I haven't turned it on in a while. So you then want some aluminum foil or baking baking paper.、Mm-hmm. Doesn't really matter too much. But basically, you're going to get if you've got two trays, that's probably better, just because you want it to be、uh, all.、Uh, you know, you don't. If you can avoid it, you prefer them not to be stacked on top of each other.、Uh, if you don't have two trays, it's not the end of the world. This is a brand new thing of foil. Oh, I can never do this. You can never do foil. Well, I can never start a brand new roll without、yeah. ripping it.、Oh. That's fine. Oh, We've yeah, ripped a little bit. That's exactly what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so far, very successful. <laughs> I just like to see everyone has, you know, struggles with the same things in the kitchen that I、It's、do. It's very sticky. There we go. So we'll just tear off that bit. Yeah. 
and uh, then we will. Okay, it's like making a pancake. The the first pancake is always uh, exactly yeah the test run. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna get just a bit of foil. This is probably all coming through great on the microphone. Oh, I it's also I really assume. glittery on the camera. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Great, brand new foil. It's nothing like that brand new foil. <laughs> So you're putting it over the wrap. That's interesting. I think I would normally just line the tray. I guess either works, right? Yeah. Just whatever you gotta do. Oh, because you're using both. I'm using both. I yeah, see. that's the thing. Just because, uh, yeah, like I said, it's because I've got a fairly sizable squash, so I'm right. gonna use both. Oh. Just because, like I said, you, it's better if this. There's enough space. I like get yeah. the squashes and all kind of stacked up one on top of the other. So yeah, as you can see, it's got all of the garam masala all over it. Mm. It's got the oil, the salt, the pepper. It's going to be tasty. Maybe this will be it. No, I don't think it'll be enough space for one squash. You want to give it some space. Yeah. All right, and then the other one. And there's a little bit of spice still in the bowl, so I'm gonna try and soak it up. Nice. There we go. Uh, Byron will be providing the soundtrack. Uh, yeah, it'd be good if you knew a few different yeah. tracks. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of stuck on this one. Yeah, I wish he could do like Freebird. <laughs> Do you have any idea what he's barking at? Does he just do this? Uh, yeah. So there's a few triggers. Um, first of all, there's his nemesis, which is Bella. And that's mm. the dog that lives upstairs. And she also likes to bark her head off. Right. Um, so basically, anytime she's coming back from a walk, she'll start barking. And then they'll get into a shouting match. <laughs> uh, right. I don't need that ball anymore. So I'm going to put that down here. And um, suitcases with wheels. <laughs> Not a fan. Not a fan of those, Byron. Wheelie yeah, anytime okay. someone in the courtyard is bringing in a wheelie suitcase, that sets them off. Uh, and sometimes just, you know, people walking in the uh, hallway outside, which when you live on the ground floor... It's going to happen quite a lot. It's going to happen quite I a imagine. lot. Yeah. Because people live above you and they need to get in and out of their That's homes. Right. And um, so he doesn't like that. <laughs> Many a trigger then. Yeah. Basically he's barking a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, Right. And um, so, yeah, I don't know if the oven is like 100% fully preheated, but it's probably good enough that we can chuck okay. that in there. Yeah. And then, you know, it's going to preheat anyway. Free up some space. Oh, it's pretty nice and warm so already. The squash is going in. The squashes are going to go into the oven. And basically, you know, it all depends on your oven. Um, but maybe about a half an hour or so until it's nice and soft. And in the meantime, we're going to get started with everything else. So, your onion, uh, you're going to take that, you're going to slice it. What I might do actually is I might start just uh, putting a bit of oil in the pan and preheating that as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe a tablespoon or so, just to coat the bottom of the, of the pan. Very nice pan. And I'll just turn that on to maybe medium or so. And um, yeah, you just want to slice your onion. Do you tend to go for nice thick slices in this recipe or more on a bit thinner side? Yeah. yeah, a bit thinner in this recipe. So something I've been asking people quite a lot, which interests me, is how and when they learned to cook whether you can really remember how you learned to cook or when that was. Yeah, um, I think it was, it was over the last few years, really. Um, oh, right, okay. I was, um, you know, when I was kind of younger and in university and so on, and until I moved to Berlin, I was, I was a bit more definitely of a functional cook. Like, I could keep myself alive, <laughs> but I didn't have that much of a clue. And um, I couldn't really make something that... I thought was really tasty. Mm. Uh, and I think it's just over the last, I think when I first moved to Berlin, 
back then also food was really cheap here. It's yeah. gotten a bit more expensive over the years, but you get like Vietnamese for, you know, like four euros or something. Yeah. Uh, so I think just because food was so cheap, I used to eat out a lot. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I probably could have saved money by not doing that, but oh well. Uh, and also I just didn't, I just didn't cook that much. And so it's, it's in the last few years that I've gotten more into it. I think also, because I used to live in England, one thing that I do miss uh, is good Indian food. Yeah. And I think that's also what drove me to start to learn to cook um, Asian food as well, just because I thought, uh, you know, compared to the standard of restaurants in, in England, the Indian food in Berlin is not up to scratch. That's and true. Even it's getting there. There are a few more recent additions to the scene that have been there, but it's yeah. taken a while. And um, even when you try to get something spicy, uh, like I've, I've even at Indian restaurants in Berlin, I've just said like, can you give me German spice? Sorry, can you give me Indian spice, not German spice? Mm, I've actually yeah. just like <laughs> said it to them in that way. Don't make it spicy for German people, make it spicy for Indians. <laughs> Does that work? Have no, you found that makes a difference? No, it no. generally doesn't make much of a difference. Because I think a lot of the, pre the sauces and stuff obviously in a restaurant are pre-made anyway. Yeah, sure. But you think they have some chili powder laying around, they could Stick throw it in. in. But yeah, I was so. in a Chinese restaurant once where they had a completely different menu for the Chinese customers that would come in mm. compared to uh, the Westerners. And yeah. we couldn't understand any of it, but um, we asked for it and basically pointed to things, and it was so much better than anything we'd had there before. Yeah. Yeah, it is one of those things um, like I think I've been in, in, in Vietnamese restaurants here before where I've seen. You know, with the family or the people that are working there, are kind of eating, and I just look over and I'm like, "Can I? Can I, I have that? that?" Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think I got more into cooking Indian food just because I sort of missed it and kind of realized the only way that I'm going to get decent Indian food here is if I learn how to make it. Yeah. Basically. Uh, cheers, by the way. You've got a beer that you've not uh, cracked into yet. Cheers. Cheers to you guys at home too. Yeah, I think my main motivation to cook was definitely because I wanted to eat delicious food. And yeah. um, the best way to do that is to learn how to cook it yourself. Yeah, and actually once you start um, cooking for yourself, you sort of realize a lot of restaurants aren't actually that good. Mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of restaurants, I mean, obviously they have to do a lot of meals for a lot of people constantly. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you can take half an hour to an hour to make something for yourself, you can... You can make something really good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right, so the onion is uh, sliced. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do now, I should get a little teaspoon for this, is um, we're going to do about a teaspoon of mustard seeds. Nice, into the hot into oil. The, into the hot oil. So this is actually something that's quite common in, in Indian food. It's called tempering. And um, what often happens is you, you get uh, whole spices and seeds and stuff that go in at the beginning. And you kind of heat them up and that releases the oils. And then you get different spices that are ground later in the process. Mm, right. And so that gives different layers of, of spices. So when you kind of heat up the spice, the whole spices at the beginning, um, yeah, it's called tempering. So we're going to go in with mustard seeds and you kind of just want to heat them up until they start to crackle. They'll kind of start to pop and sort of jump out of the pan. Like mustard popcorn. Yeah. Maybe I can even turn it up a little bit. I can hear it sizzling. You've got it on that medium high at the moment? Yeah. But uh, it shouldn't take too long, maybe like a cup, depending on how hot the pan is. Maybe I'll even just turn it up. Whack it right up. And basically once it, um, once it starts popping, then you're going to throw in the onions. Nice. Yeah, I know you said they were only like an optional thing but I love mustard seeds mm. like since starting to cook with them I really they really do add a level of a layer of flavor yeah so generally when you do temper spices mustard seeds get used a lot for this cumin seeds as well uh, are yeah. often used for this coriander seeds perhaps too? I think so yeah. yeah yeah anything you'd tend to get whole mm. I feel like I can smell the smoke of the oil yeah, so that just kind of, um, yeah, this process just releases the oils inside of the Caught seeds. That fly. It's been nice. buzzing around. For well done. Me. Thank you very much. Yeah, Seb has a 
very good spice collection. Yeah. As have many of uh, our cooks so far. Yeah, that's the thing. If you if you do want to get into cooking more Asian stuff, you do have to really get into the spices. Which some... if you're in Berlin, he was saying he mostly gets from the Maybachhofer mm -hmm. market. Yeah, a lot of the good. some of the various markets in Berlin, they'll have um, people that sell spices that that um, are pretty good. Mm -hmm. There's one that was a bit more obscure that I had to order online. This is called Amchor. Ooh. And it's actually um, dried mango, like uh, unripe mango, uh -huh. green mango, that's then dried and then powdered. Wow, what did you use that for? Um, so you, you might use that in like um, a chana, chana sag, like a chickpea, chickpea and spinach curry. Mm -hmm. You might use that in that. It gives it like a kind of sort of acidic kind of fruity flavor. Amazing. And you can see now that the mustard seeds are starting to pop. They're starting to fly around. Yeah. See that? They're jumping about. They're jumping about. So we can turn the heat down at this point. Whee. Put it back down to medium and then chuck the onions in. Nice. And yeah, basically they're going to go in there for maybe 10 minutes or so. Uh, until they're kind of golden, you know, sort of nice and soft and kind of starting to caramelize. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we can prepare the garlic. So it's up to you how much uh, you want to use. The recipe, I believe, says three. I like garlic, so we're going to go with four. You can do more if you really like garlic. You can't really have too much of it, I don't think, but maybe if you really hate it or... If garlic tastes very strong to you, maybe put in a little bit less. Um, and I think uh, in a couple of previous videos, they've already explained the uh, standard garlic chopping The one method, tip we all have. <laughs> which is to kind of cut off this bit and then just sort of bash it. Yeah. And then that means that the skin comes right off. Let's see. Yep. And then basically, I usually just kind of, first of all, slice it. Like that. Fine slices? Yeah, as fine as you can get them. It doesn't matter too much. And then once that's done, you sort of put it all in the middle. And then with your fingers just on top over here, you just do this kind of rocking motion. Right? And then you can bring it back to the center. Beautiful. So it's kind of minced in the yeah. end. Yeah, so this garlic, we're going to mince it. And uh, yeah, same thing for the other ones. Obviously, if you have a garlic crusher, although I feel like it does change how present the garlic is in mm. the dish, uh, crushing to chopping. Yeah, I do have one, but I never really use it. Yeah. I don't really like it that much. Because like, um, there's always like a bunch of the garlic that gets stuck to mm -hmm. the... Bit. The crushy bit. I don't know what the technical term is. Those mustard seeds are actually smelling really pungent, aren't they? Yeah. That's nice. Just give that a stir every now and then. So cooking for you, does that occupy kind of a, a relaxing role or is it more um, you do cook because you like to eat but you don't find it that relaxing? No, it, it is relaxing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I'll often like uh, listen to podcasts or something while I'm cooking. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, listen to music. Time for music and podcasts. Yeah. And, that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, I found, uh, you know, they, they kind of say like every man eventually turns into his dad. Uh, <laughs> I think that's kind of part of it. Like my, you know, my family growing up, my mum. You know, she, she always cooked stuff that was good and healthy and stuff, but she was definitely the more functional cook. Mm -hmm. um, my dad was often working uh, during the week, so she was the one that basically kept us alive. Mm -hmm. um, whereas my dad, you know, after a long week at work, you know, the, the kitchen was this sort of domain. You know, he, he's the type that if he's making like, I don't know, uh, if he's making a risotto or something, he'll get up early in the morning, go to the supermarket, make the stock from scratch, nice. you know, spend all day like uh, into the early afternoon just in the kitchen, like actually making something really nice. Yeah. And that's his way, I think, of, you know, after a long week, um, you know, 
winding down, yeah. creating something, yeah. doing something totally different. So what he does in his working week, yeah. So I found that that is something that I've been doing more and more as I've gotten older. Because, like they say, every man ends up turning into his dad. <laughs> your dad is the Spanish side of your family, right? Uh, it's, it's a long story. Yeah. He's Argentinian-Italian. Mm. Um, yeah. And, uh, well, the Spanish-speaking side, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, my mum's English. Did he cook any typical dishes from those cultures? Um, he cooks a lot of Italian, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, you can make... More or less, I guess his, um, he sort of said, like, I've cooked Indian stuff for him before, and he, he's like, oh, no, I can't do that because I just don't know my way around the, the spices mm. used for it. I'm like, well, you can learn anything. And he's like, no. <laughs> I think he's like, I don't know. It's too late. It's too late for me now. <laughs> but obviously, like, all the, you know, it's all the, it's all the flavor combinations, right, mm-hmm. with a certain style of cooking, like with Italian food, you know, with all the herbs that are typical for Italian food, like he just knows his way around that very yeah. well, and that's what he does very well. Italian, Spanish, French. Because I do find that, that I can does. invent in Mediterranean cooking in a way that I can't invent um, in Indian cuisine, for example. Yeah. I still find very, feel I'm very bound to recipes. Um, with the cooking involving spices. I don't trust my intuition with it. And maybe that's something that would come over time as well. Yeah, I think that just, just comes over time of getting to know the ingredients. Yeah. Um, you know, getting to know what works together. What function they all play. So, I mean, for example, like I am doing this as the recipe book entails, but for example, I know that if when we were making the mustard at the beginning, if I'd thrown in some cumin seeds, that would go perfectly well with it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, Indian cuisine, once you're kind of familiar with the spices and also generally garlic and ginger use all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, a fair bit of onions. Um, and then there's lots of different... Um, one thing I, I, I think um, part, part of the reason why I like to make this sort of food as well is that I'm mostly vegetarian at home. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not vegetarian. I, I eat meat when I'm in a restaurant or if someone else is cooking for me or whatever. Um, but um, uh, I started a few years just being basically vegetarian at home. Yeah. Maybe once for a treat, I'll get like, I don't know, uh, some chicken or whatever. But um, yeah, I find that um, there's an endless variety of vegetarian food in Indian food. Yes. And they really know how to use lentils and chickpeas and beans and various pulses and all of that kind of stuff absolutely yeah not this reliance on meat for flavor Mm. which a lot of western cooking has yeah i mean the flavor really comes from the spices especially yeah but yeah like they really know how to make lentils shine for example Mm -hmm. so the onions are getting soft are they now yeah, maybe Getting just there. a little bit longer, a little bit soft, a little bit more golden. The garlic is prepped. Yeah, Nicely that's minced. the garlic done. And uh, basically, we'll give we'll give the onions a couple more minutes. Yeah. And uh, then we'll chuck in the the garlic. Have you been to India? Nope. Mm. I would love to go. Uh, I'm sure my conception of what Indian food is. I mean, I kind of am familiar with some of the stuff that you get over there that you wouldn't necessarily get in a restaurant over here. But um, no, I'd love to go there as a, as a food trip. Absolutely. Because also, like, there's a lot of, obviously, you know, Indian chefs will say, you know, saying Indian food is like saying European food. Yeah, totally. It's um, so different region to region. Yeah, I mean, we're using coconut in this one, which I think you generally find more in, in the south. Yeah, you very don't really get in Carolyn food, for example. Yeah, you don't really get coconut in northern Indian cuisine, mm-hmm. for example. So it's actually, you know, hugely diverse and a lot of regional variation and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I remember my first time in the north of the country, um, kind of going through Rajasthan and finding the food. Um, actually quite bland because I just wasn't used to the subtlety of the spices basically mm. I think in Indian food in the UK there's so much sugar in there so much mm. sugar so much salt so much butter yeah and 
there's so much subtle spicing in um, at least the authentic Indian food that I was eating that it took me a while to get into it. Um, I think I was more into the Southern Carolyn style for mm. sure. That for me was more flavorful. Yeah, well, it's interesting. A lot of the Indian chefs in the UK are actually... Um, a lot of them are kind of Bangladeshi, I think, Pakistani as well. Mm. But, I mean, it's one of those sort of migrant food traditions that has taken on its own character. Yeah. You know, a little bit like Italian-American food isn't the same as Italian food. Yeah, sure. It's not necessarily worse. It's just, it's just a different thing. It's it developed in its own yeah. way. And I think kind of the same thing has happened with British Indian food. But I do love that classic British tikka masala that is bright pink and yeah. you just don't know why. Yeah. And um, it's so sweet. And it's different in every... They did... I remember... Uh, I remember reading that a few years ago they did this kind of survey of uh, a bunch of Indian restaurants to figure out, you know, what they put... You know, what is a chicken tikka masala, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are the ingredients to it? And uh, the only common ingredient that they found in all of them was chicken. <laughs> really? uh, apart from that it, there's no it means nothing there's no correct way to, I mean masala just means mix yeah, right yeah, yeah. like a masala spice is, yeah. you know that's like a spice mix um, garam masala for example is what we used in this um, so it's just chicken tikka right chicken cooked in a tikka oven and then I think sometimes they don't even take their oven it yeah, I got a chicken probably. tikka masala here once it was definitely the same chicken that was in all the other curries that yeah tikka, that's probably true alright so I think that's looking alright so we're going to throw in brown, which is nice. the garlic and just kind of stir, stir fry that for a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. I used to always put garlic and onion in together at the beginning of a dish. And then it was mm. only later that I kind of learned that garlic actually kind of cooks and even burns a lot quicker than onion does. So Definitely. it's probably a better idea to put it in a little bit later. Soft, almost ginger. caramelized onions make such a great base to so many dishes, but garlic really can't take that much cooking. Ah, that's a good smell. That is a very good smell. I always remember when my parents were cooking, uh, or my dad was cooking or whatever at home, I would come into the kitchen and I would just go, oh, I don't, what are you cooking? It smells so good. And I would just say, it's just garlic and onion. Yeah. <laughs> I find that or butter can just immediately make your taste buds start. Start doing whatever they do. What do taste buds do? <laughs> All right. So, yeah, maybe a tiny bit longer, and then we're going to add in the beans. So, if you've got a can of beans, you might want to drain want them to at this point. Um, do you need to rinse them if they're in a can? Is it a bit like kids I think beans? it's probably a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Mmm. Garlic. Can we see into your oven? No. Does it have a light? It does. Yeah, it's lit I'm just up. Let's see if it was. Oh. We can see the squash bubbling. That looks good. It's bubbling away. That's very good. All right. Let's uh, throw those beans in. So the beans are added to the pan. I don't think I've ever cooked with uh, these black eyed beans. I don't, I don't think I ever had before I met this recipe, actually. You met the recipe. I, like that. I, I said made, but oh. we'll, go with, we'll go with met. That's fine. Met it on your walk. And yeah, just heat those up for a little bit. And uh, then the tomatoes. Ah, uh, uh, yes. So we've got these two medium tomatoes, and basically you want wedges. Um, one trick that I learned for cutting tomatoes when I was doing a cooking class in Budapest a few years ago, mm. um, often they can be a little bit annoying because sometimes the knife won't really catch the skin and it'll kind of slip off, so it can be a little bit annoying to chop tomatoes sometimes. The easy solution for that, if you have one of these... A bread knife, a serrated knife, it actually just goes right through. Yeah. So that's, uh, if you find tomato chopping to be pesky, uh, this is a solution you can try. I do, that's a very good tip. And basically you just want some wedges. But I think I mostly find it pesky because my knives aren't sharp enough. Yeah. Also that, yeah. yeah. So 
kind of thin wedges. Yeah. Maybe going for. The more fresh ingredients you can get into a dish, the better. So I'm sure you could use tin tomatoes for this, yeah. but why? Why would you? Yeah, and it's not it's not like an overwhelming amount of tomatoes for yeah. this. Uh, but it's just to give it something a little bit extra. So I think that's pretty much warm through. And basically, you just want the tomatoes to start getting kind of soft and a bit jammy. So we'll add those in now. And this is, yeah, it all just comes together in one pan, actually. Yeah. Doesn't really need anything mm -hmm. else. I mean, we'll do another pan for the bread, but it's not technically a one pot dish because you need the oven, but. Mm. Seems to have calmed down at least. Yeah. Yeah, he's had a long day of uh, uh, lying down. Oh, yeah. Barking. Eating rabbit's ears. Eating rabbit's ears. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love how you casually leave a lot of stuff on your stove. <laughs> how I want I guess it doesn't really oh, yeah. heat up around. Yeah, it's fine. Surface space. Uh, I don't think we need the chopping board anymore, unless I'm mistaken. No, we should be good for the chopping board, so we can get that out of the way. Nice. Always clean as you go uh, is a lesson that I often don't follow. But, Same. Uh, but it's good to pretend that we do yeah. when we're being filmed. Continuing the theme of earlier videos, Seb was also one of those lucky enough to get an inbuilt kitchen in Berlin. Yes. A very nice one. Yeah, it is a very nice kitchen. I mean, the, the only thing is the oven, which is a fireball. Uh, but apart from that, all you have to do is put the temperature in the oven down to half of what the recipe says, <laughs> uh, and then it's fine. How long did it take you to realize that your oven was I think it took a while, yeah. Well, it wasn't that bad when I first moved in. Ah, uh, okay. I think it's gradually got. Worst uh, of time. Yeah. Started off as an oven and became a cremation chamber. <laughs> Have you had it checked? No, maybe I should. <laughs> maybe. maybe, maybe the prop like maybe it's not irredeemably broken. Maybe the problem can be fixed. But uh, yeah. I mean, if you know how to deal with it, it's not a huge issue. I think it's actually starting to. I think perhaps some of that might be done already, so I can just take it out now. Yours might take a little bit longer, it might take a little bit less, but it's a good idea to just check up on it. It's got a bit of a ground, ground coating to it. It's looking nice and soft. I think maybe we can do just a little bit longer. A little longer. But it's actually starting to look all right. Nice. Yeah, I guess it's been in for about 20 minutes. Yeah. So 20 minutes to half an hour, yeah. depending, you know, your oven might be a little bit different. Um, but yeah, 20 minutes to half an hour is roughly how long it should take. And that's kind of roughly how long this takes as well. Um, to be fair, I think if you leave squash in for too long, it nothing bad happens. Like it only gets a bit yeah. more mushy and browned. That tomato is starting to soften up. And yeah, you just want to get a little bit of the moisture out of it. That's good. Yeah, so we've been more or less the entire time on a kind of medium high sort of heat. Yeah. How are your um, electric hobs? Are they pretty good or do they take a long time to get to the heat that you they want? They do take a while to, and they also take a while to cool down. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I have gas hobs again now and it's a dream. Which I figured out a good way for making rice when I, with, with this hob, which is um, 
I'll just bring it to the boil, and then as soon as it comes to the boil, I'll just turn it off. Mm. Uh, and because it takes a while to cool down, it's still hot, but it gets progressively less hot, and then it just kind of steams the rice by itself. Wow. So that's a, I don't know, you can try that. That's a tip if you want to cook rice with one of these electric hobs. I Get it to the boil and then just switch it off, but leave it on the hob. I always fail to cook rice properly. Um, another little trick actually, because um, if you're using like basmati and stuff, you want to wash it first and then leave it to soak for about 20 minutes or so. Oh. Yeah. Just if you have the time, like obviously if you can't be bothered, don't worry about what it. What does that do you? I find it does make it a fair bit fluffier. Okay. Like you get really nice fluffy, fluffy does rice it if you do that. affect the cooking time at all? No, because, well, it depends. So if I was making something like this, I would... Probably the first thing I would do is wash the rice and then just leave it to soak and then I can start doing everything else and then when it's time to make the rice, uh, I can then check oh, it Oh, but in. I mean of the rice. Oh, right. No. Yeah. Right, I see. No, no, no. It's the same cooking time for the rice. Right. Okay, so I think that tomato is looking soft now. It's looking good. It's smelling it's even smelling. better. Mm. That is all coming together very nicely mm -hmm. and um, yeah so if uh, you remember earlier on I said uh, often in Indian cuisine you'll have spices that go in at the beginning and then some more later on and so now we're going to go in with turmeric maybe about I guess that's maybe about three quarter teaspoon and that's going to give it a really nice vibrant color mm -hmm. And depending on whether or how much chili you want, I go in with about maybe half a teaspoon of this chili powder, but this one is actually one that I found at the Asian supermarket that's quite potent. Not German spice, this is real yeah. spice. And also a bit of salt and pepper. That was maybe what, teaspoon, something like that? Mm -hmm. Crack some pepper in. And then we're gonna go in with this bad boy. Shaking up the coconut milk. So we got a tin of coconut milk, 400 mils, and that's just all gonna go in. <laughs> and with the turmeric, it's gonna turn a really beautiful color. And we'll give that a mix round. Yes, I say to that. How's that smelling? Really, really good. Salivating. And uh, yeah, we'll just let that heat up for a little bit. And then if there's just one final thing that we're going to add, which is, of course, we're going to take the squash out and chuck it in there. And uh, if the squash is, the good thing is that coconut milk, that can just kind of stay there being warm. So if the squash isn't done yet, um, you can just keep it warm for now until mm -hmm. the squash is done. Yeah, I think certainly at least the, I think for me, whoops, the uh, bottom one maybe might take a tiny bit longer, but certainly the top one is probably done by now. So yeah, I can... True. they might be cooking at slightly different speeds. Oh, hello, what is that? Look at that. <laughs> it's Pac-Man. I'm just going to check on that. See how it is. Yeah, I mean, I can just go right through that with a fork, so that's through. that's looking fine. And yeah. you can see it's got the garam masala all over it, mm -hmm. so that's a lot of flavor that's in there. Which is soon going to be in the sauce. Exactly. So we can chuck that all in. Oh, wow. So if you don't know what to do with the pumpkin, this is something different you can try. I've been eating so much pumpkin, pumpkin squash this autumn. Yeah. 
It is one of my favorite things, actually. Yeah. I love pumpkin soup. Yeah, I've not made any soups yet. I need to start my soup season. Speaking of how much pasta I eat, one of my go-to dishes in the autumn is uh, roasted pumpkin or butternut squash with pasta and feta and then just some yeah. toasted pine nuts on top. Nice. Oh, and you roast some garlic with the um, pumpkin and squeeze that into the pasta. It's just That's amazing. How are you even going to fit the other half? <laughs> I oh, will make it work. Mm. Look at that. It's coated in this amazing sauce. Mm -hmm. I'm into it. And I'll just check whether the bottom one's done. Oh, it should probably be done anyway. Yep, yeah, that looks fine. Mm, yep. Yeah. So, same thing here. The sauce is bubbling nicely. Ooh, that's hot. <laughs> yeah. Should probably just get some tongs. I do have some. Never mind, they're in the wash. <laughs> You're gonna have to make dip. Yeah. It's okay, it's better for the tongless people at home. Now you could serve that with rice, it goes really well with rice. Yeah. Like I said, we've got some quick bread to make. Probably some coriander on top might be nice too, huh? Mm. If you have some. Unless you're one of those people that can't stand coriander. Yeah. Oh, it smells incredible. And then, yeah, again, just coat that. And yeah, the coconut sauce is, start, is going to start to get really thick as well. Mm. It's going to stick to all of the squash. What makes it thicken up, I wonder, given that there's no thickening agent in there? Well, it, I think it's more just the liquid boils off. Right. And um, yeah, so what we're going to do, first of all, I'll wash the knife and put it away. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna, for those of you that have never made a roti before, yeah, which I hadn't until lockdown, and I am not a baker. Um, I mean, I don't really have the oven to be a baker anyway. Um, <laughs> for something that needs to be so precise in its temperature, that could yeah, be Yeah, exactly. So I don't bake, generally speaking, uh, and even I was able to do this. Uh, it's, it's the easiest bread you'll ever make. And uh, it's might not be like the most incredible bread you've ever had, right? So it might not compare to like, I don't know, a sourdough that has a three-year-old starter or sure. like a really amazing naan bread or something. But it's it's a pretty good bread that you can put together in just a few minutes. And that's, that's something a that I think, point for me. you know, and like um, I think a lot of people in India would just have, you know, maybe like working people and so on, they might have for lunch just uh, a bit of roti with some chutney, you know? Mm. And like, that's, a, that's also a really good snack. If you've got some lime pickle or some chutney or whatever in the fridge, mm -hmm. just get a roti, chuck it on there and you're done. So usually what I will do, first of all, is um, I'm actually gonna get these things out of the way. And then I'm gonna actually preheat my pan. I'm gonna use that smaller pan. Um, and uh, you want basically the pan to be really ripping hot when you uh, put the bread in. Ripping hot. Yeah, so I'm actually going to use the, uh, see that. get that in there without too much hassle. I'll just get it in. That's how helpful I'm being Wherever <laughs> Can it I goes. help you as well? That's fine. I'll just get that in wherever. It doesn't matter too much. Let's get it out of the way. And um, yeah, so actually what I do with this uh, stove, 
is uh, I've got a small pan which you think that's going to go on top of the smaller thing but I'm actually going to put it on the big one uh, and I'm going to whack the heat up all the way to the top right um, just because it takes a bit longer to heat up and so on mm -hmm. um, but also uh, you do want that pan to be very very hot if you have like a crepe pan or something like that that would actually work really well I don't have one of those but you don't need one of those you can just use a smaller pan like this and let's see uh, I'll just grab a clean bowl over here because this is where I'm going to measure out my flour. So you want, usually I go for about 25 grams. I'll just take that down a little bit. 25 grams of flour per bread. I do have a scale. If you are obviously making bread and working with this kind of stuff, it's probably a good idea to have one. There's the one maybe piece of specialist equipment. Um, but I'll tell you what, if you don't have one, I'll just do tablespoons and we'll measure out how much uh, 25 grams is. Happily, because that we're might... pre-recording this, we can tell everyone this in the ingredients video anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, the scale would work well if you don't have one. Let's see, how many tablespoons roughly is 25 grams of flour? Let's give it a go. Like I said, I'm going to do half and half. Mm-hmm. So I got some white flour. So actually about two tablespoons. That's about 25 grams. I actually went a little bit over, but yeah, mm -hmm. two tablespoons of flour, roughly. Cool. So I got 50 grams of white flour. Wait, I thought you were going for 25. Yeah, I'm making four breads, so ah, I should have mentioned that. Sure, yeah, yes. I should have mentioned that. So, yeah. So this is a point where, because they probably, do they keep well, these breads? Or should people only be making as much as they'd want to eat right now? Um, I think I've kept them like in foil in the fridge for a couple okay. of days before. That's probably all right. And then we're going to go in with um, about a... Whoops. There you go, that should be fun. Maybe about a teaspoon or so of oil. So you've done 50 grams of whole wheat, that's what it's called, and 50 grams of plain. Yeah, that's right. We were up to uh, 100 grams, weren't yeah. we? Yeah, that's what it said on the scale. <laughs> Just <laughs> thought I'd check. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and then, you know, maybe about a teaspoon of oil. Good thing about this bread also is I don't really measure it out too much. It can be just one of those breads that just sort of, you know, you don't need to be super specific about everything. That's handy. I'm going to turn that down just to a low heat just because that's pretty much ready to go. So you'll just have that sitting on simmer while we do the breads. Yeah. So you're just mixing that with your hands? Yep. Mm -hmm. And then maybe about a teaspoon of salt as well. And just mix that up. And it should feel quite kind of crumbly mm -hmm. with the oil in there. So yeah, you want it to be yeah, kind of nice and crumbly. And then for the water, I'm actually, uh, again, I think this is a bread that's good to just kind of learn to get a feel for bread and to get a feel for dough. I'm not going to measure out the water. You want hot water. Um, and basically, you know, with a lot of Western breads, you start off the dough quite wet and then you just keep adding flour until it's drier. So with this one, you're kind of doing the other way around. So you want to start it off dry and then just kind of add water to it gradually until, um, until it's basically just kind of wet enough to make a dough. Okay. Um, so yeah, like I said, this is a thing you can kind of practice to just get, your, get a feel for it. So we'll just add a little bit, mix that in. It's still a fair bit of dry stuff. Hopefully I don't overdo it, but it's looking okay so far. Yes, you could always add a bit more flour. Yeah, exactly. Did, right? There's still just a tiny bit of it that's dry over there. This is, I think, perhaps almost there. Strange things to colours that does it? Hob looks pink. The hob looks pink. Uh, red. Yeah, I think that's about enough, right? So 
you can see you've got a dough. Yeah, looks good. And it's not too wet. You can work with that. So yeah, like I said, it's a good it's a good way to not have to measure things all the time. Mm -hmm. To just make a bread that's a bit more intuitive. That it's not like yeah, it's the way bread should be made. Should be made. Well, I mean, it depends. But like the old fashioned, <laughs> you know. Yeah. This, you know, I think in India is quite, like I said, it's, it's sort of working people food, peasant food, you know, simple bread that you maybe just put a chutney on. Yeah. And then, let's see, we're going to put some flour on the surface and we're going to just knead it a little bit. So yeah, basically you kind of stretch it out and then you pull it back in, right? So mm -hmm. you stretch it out, you pull it back in, and then you push down with your hand. And you just do that for a few minutes. And then you'll have a pretty decent dough to work with. So we're making it all elastic. Yeah, so what you're actually doing is you're working the gluten. Mm -hmm. This is the one thing that is uh, special about flour. It's, for example, it's the reason why when you get like a corn tortilla, it tends to kind of split apart a lot more than a wheat tortilla. Yeah. It's the gluten that just is this really nice elastic. It's got a bad rap at the moment, but... Uh, That's what does wheat? Gluten. So yeah, and that's pretty much your bread dough. I can feel the heat coming off this pan. This yeah. is a very hot pan. Yeah, and it, it cooks in seconds, literally. Yeah. yeah, so that's why we're basically just overloading the pan with heat. Mm -hmm. What they even do um, sometimes when they're cooking rotis is they'll cook it on the open flame. Yeah. Which I don't have an open flame, so I'm not going <laughs> to do that. That's best. If you have an open flame, maybe you can try it. Uh, all right, and so we've got our ball of dough. We're just going to cut it into four. So half it, and then half it again. And those look, I guess, about right. Maybe a little bit more for that one. Yeah, I mean, they're good enough. And uh, yeah, rolling pin, which I have over here. Basically, what you want to do now is you want to dip your, yeah, get your surface, you know, spread some flour on it, and you probably also just to get a decent amount of flour on it. It's not a bad idea to just dip the balls of dough in some flour. And then... So if you don't have a rolling pin, you can use a wine bottle. Yeah, wine bottle is fine. And then basically you start off by just kind of pushing it down and making a disc, right? So just do what you can, make a disc out of that, and then you get your rolling pin or wine bottle, and uh, you're just gonna try and roll them out quite flat. And the technique to this is uh, you, can, you roll it out a little bit, and then you move it kind of maybe, I guess that's about 45 degrees. Um, now, if I were an Indian mum, I would be able to get this perfectly round. <laughs> Uh, I'm not an Indian mum, so yeah. that's not going to happen. But yeah, it's a good it's alternative to like. Good to me. It's a good alternative to like a tortilla, you know. Absolutely. Also. So you yeah, this one is looking nice reasonably flat. round. Um, quite nice and thin. Yeah, you do want it to get quite thin. It's looking very professionally round, I have to say. Yeah, this is this is one of my better ones actually. Yeah, Good thing the cameras are rolling. I just needed uh, that extra. Whoa, you almost Oops. got me with that rolling pin. So yeah, that's nice and flat. I think that one's pretty much ready to go. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, you, you you're gonna want probably a spatula for this because you're actually gonna kind of push down on it. And this is really basically have a plate or something ready to go where the bread is gonna go because this is really gonna be seconds. All right, so are we ready? Let's go. And you kind of want to push down on it. Mm -hmm. And that should make it kind of bubble up a little bit. If it's done right, we'll see. There should be kind of bubbles emerging from it. 
what I've been for bubbles. This is tense. You see that? Oh yeah. Oh, we got bubbles. And you basically, you're trying to get a bit of a char on it. Yeah. There's a bubble. So that's a good sign. That is a good sign. Let's see how it's doing. Yep, see? Oh, nice. So it's got that nice char to it. Yeah, it's literally about 30 seconds or so on each side. That's incredible. There you go. How long did wow. it take to make a bread? <laughs> right? Here is a bread. That's the quickest bread you'll ever make. That's incredible. So it's kind of a similar process for the other ones. Again. Because I should say, Seb also makes an incredible naan bread. But... That's a bit more that's effort. That's a bit more time-consuming. You can also, uh, if you do want to be a bit more... Um, What's the word? Uh, luxurious, I suppose, or decadent. Uh, you can rub some melted butter or a ghee mm -hmm. on top of that. Mm -hmm. I don't have melted butter, so we're not going to do that, but that'll... Why would you say that then? <laughs> I'm just deeply disappointed. But yeah, a bit of melted butter on top of those works a treat. This one's not quite as round. That's okay, we'll forgive you. Nailed the first one, that's hard to do. Yeah, you know when you were talking earlier about like how a pancake, like usually the first pancake mm. is the trial run, yeah. but that's the absolute star, I think. Well, we've still got two to go. Oh, true. How long have we been cooking for now? Uh, we just reached the hour mark. All right, so Perfect. it's pretty much all come together. Yeah. I um, turned the heat off as well, because that's just kind of bubbling away. Oh, that, that simmer is just residual heat, is it? From yeah, I turned it off. Um, maybe I should have mentioned it. Well, it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, I turned it off just before I started rolling out this second bread. That does stay hot for a long time then, doesn't it? I don't think it matters because I think basically yours is still simmering, so most people's mm -hmm. will be as well. So we got some bubbles there. Let's see how it's looking. Yep, looking good. Oh. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> we might have caught a rodent in Little this. Little <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed Byron didn't come running in at that noise. <laughs> Right. It's incredible how this is just flour, you yep. know? Like, it, it is just something really magical, isn't it? How yeah. like flour and water just turn into mm -hmm. something that's just completely different. <laughs> when like you, just, that you just mix it together flour. and apply heat and it just becomes something just unrecognizable. I'm so tempted to... Do you want a piece? I do, I really do. Just a little... I haven't done this yet. But See I how it is. Oh, it's hot. Tight. Mm. Is it good? Tastes like bread. Yeah. <laughs> and it takes no time. That's really good. Oh. All right. So same process for the next roti. Mm. I think we need to get Byron to make an appearance. Can you call him in for us? Byron. Treat. How did he not? <laughs> yeah, now he's running. <laughs> treat? Did someone say treat? He's got these little dried fish treats. Oh, delicious. This is the dog that eats. He eats better than me. Rabbit ears, also, he, by the way. Yeah. Um, I should actually give him a treat now we've got him. I, in. Yeah. <laughs> Are they in the it's cupboard? just over there, yeah. We'll try and keep filming you. Well, I get them. This is a very, this is a square roti I've got, but it doesn't matter. Oh my goodness, these things. Yep. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> he goes crazy for them. He eats the most rank snacks. Oh, well, you're a dog. I would give it to him, but I need to use my hands no, to make okay. roti. I'm on it. <laughs> You ready for this, Byron? You lucky little pup. Sit. Does he sit? He does. Sit. Good. And put it on the ground and tell him to wait. 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 Okay, go on. Oh. <laughs> he looks so small on camera. I mean, he is so small. But... Sometimes when I see him from the distance, like if someone else is walking in, a friend is walking in or whatever, and I'm kind of a little bit behind him, I'll look at him and go, wow, you are really tiny. Yeah, he's too small for this world. 
All right, we've only got one roti left. I can't get over how good those rotis are. Yeah, and it's just, like I, I said... I can't these fish are. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have got these out just before we're about to eat. Is one enough for him, or is he expecting more? And yeah, like I said, it's the easiest bread to make, and there's nothing wrong with it. No. It's good bread. It's very good bread. Most of this is looking delicious. I imagine the longer that sits, the better, really, right? It all just kind of merges together. Make some good leftovers. Yeah, this is about four portions. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you can eat that. That'll keep in the fridge over a few days. The flavors will meld together. I find any cooking with spices tends to benefit actually from a few days in yeah. the fridge and then reheating. Any anything that's kind of like a stew type thing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe the first one was the best. I These ones are not coming out so around. Uh, I didn't watch your last one. It's, it's a bit of right. a square. You've got a, you've got a bit of a heart, a strange heart <laughs> going on there. <laughs> Looks like one of those uh, Midwestern American states on the map. The <laughs> yeah. ones that they're just kind of square and everyone's forgotten about them. I'm waiting for Jesus' face to appear in one of them. <laughs> Maybe it'll be this one. All right, that's good enough. Oh, this one's quite thin. All right, last one. Last roti. Also, I'm definitely... Oh, no! Oh, it's all It's salvageable. Wrong. It's salvageable. It's all good. Um, I'm definitely going to eat two rotis. So I think maybe yeah. four is enough for two, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. Unless you've got rice as well, in which case. Yeah. Maybe not. Byron has got some bubbles in there. On his little kitchen blanket. Is that his little station? Yeah, <laughs> that is his station. All right, maybe I'll try to be fancy. You're going to flip it? No, yeah. I'm going to do this. Oh. What? <laughs> Open flame, sort of. And I that's just a few seconds. There you go. Fire. Wow. Open flame. I was not expecting that. <laughs> Talk about like going out with an incredible finale. Yeah. That was really good. Yeah, so if you, want, if you, if you actually have an open flame, uh, you can just chuck it on there. Um, but that's obviously We're just, not necessarily... You're going to do that for two seconds, really. Yeah. Not for very long. Probably and so, be yeah, we've got some rotis. Beautiful. Uh, should I show us how you up? Sure. And then it's time to eat. So, let's just stir that around a little bit. Look at that. That's looking luxurious. It is. <laughs> so we got... Oh, that smells amazing. Smell that. Oh, my God. And then stick a little roti inside. Of roti's on there. Beautiful. Yeah. There you go. Amazing. All right, everyone. Well, I hope yours turned out as incredible as this. Guten appetit. Let us know how it is. And thank you again, Seb, for uh, being our cook for this week. Incredible job. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.